thanks to all the audience who follows our broadcast. We are live on the second day of the 2020 International Web-Based Neurosurgery Congress. Remember, we're streaming on YouTube Live too. We have the honor today of having Dr. Juan Uribe. Dr. Uribe is a well-known neurosurgeon from Barrow Neurological Institute. He is chief of the Division of Spinal Disorders, ultrasound Chair of Spine Research, and professors and vice chairman of neurosurgery at Barrow Neurological Institute. Today at the IWBNC, Dr. Uribe is going to share a lecture on the MIS lateral paradigm. Please type your questions on the Q&A section. We will read them after the end of Dr. Uribe's intervention. Welcome, Dr. Uribe, and thank you. It's all yours. Thanks very much. Um, hopefully, uh, we have a good sound and good images. So to, it's an honor for me to be uh, here today and uh, share with you what I think is one of the biggest um, changes on the spine over the last 20 years. And um, just to recap, to me, um, the last 20 to 30 years in the spine, three or four big techniques or procedures have shown up. Which one? Um, the first one was the, obviously the anterior cervical discectomies. Second one was the pedicle screws, then the kyphoplasties, and then the last one probably and the newest has been the lateral access to the spine, which now they have multiple modifications, but its original concept going to the retroperitoneum through the psoas into the spine is, I would say, the most um, less footprint procedure and is the one that probably gives uh, the better ex exp exponential and ex, uh, exposure of the procedure. So uh, today what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, show you uh, why is so good the lateral access to the spine. I'm going to give you like a tour through the world of the lateral access to the spine and in different applications. So the first question is why lateral became so popular and why is now a procedure that actually works? So the first thing comes if we going back to the basics. So if you have a procedure that decompress, specifically are able to release the neural structures. And as you know, on the lateral surgery is by indirect decompression. It means like by restoring the disc height, then you can get the decompression of the neural elements. Second, it's an amazing the way that provide alignment of the spine. When this cage just goes from side to side and enter into the disc space from one diaphysis to the other diaphysis actually provides amazing alignment. In this, in this example, as you see here, just the coronal, for example, take a look at how much impact has on the coronal um, alignment when just these cages go through and through. And then obviously the fusion, which is the best environment for a fusion on the spine is probably the interbody space, the size of the cages and the amount of graft that can be placed actually makes a really good environment for a fusion. And then finally, is a really good source of providing anterior column support. So as we see, this procedure meets what I think is the four uh, more important factors for a surgery to work on the spine. One, decompress, align, fuse, and provide support. So I'm gonna start showing you a different examples on using the lateral uh, percutaneous minimal invasive techniques and how actually you can apply to your daily activities as a spine surgeons. And this is my goal. Hopefully I can give you a more practical uh, talk today and some of the cases that you will see, actually there are everyday cases that hopefully you get inspired and use this technique and include it in your armamentarium. So this, and for example, we see here in this paper, uh, what we published a few years ago, we showed actually how safe is using the minimal invasive lateral transoas approach for grade two spondies. And uh, this is good because I'd like to show you is because uh, the initial concept of the lateral transoas approach and in general, all the lateral access to the spine, it was a big belief that the lower lumbar levels, specifically the L4, L5 was absolutely a contraindication because the high rate of lumbar plexus injuries. But 
we learned through the years that actually, as long as you are able to retract the lumbar plexus from anterior to posterior, and the retraction is minimal and the time is limited, they say you don't retract more than 20 minutes every time you are in uh, retracting the lumbar plexus. Actually, the outcomes are really good in terms of uh, uh, avoidance of lumbar plexus injury. And then you take all the advantages of the lateral. So let's see, for example, this case. So this is a 64 year old male with significant back and leg pain. And as you see here on the three foot standing films, uh, the, uh, it was not uh, any sagittal imbalance. This is that the classic patient that comes to your clinics with a high pelvic incidence, with a hyperlordosis that somehow develop a spondylolisthesis. As we've seen here on the left, the a, um, um, CT, and we see the vacuum phenomenon, the spondylolisthesis, and also on the MRI, there is a cl classic appearance of the uh, spondylolisthesis with foraminal stenosis, central stenosis, and obviously the anterior stesis of L4 or L5. So this is actually an everyday case, and I'm sure that most of you have been dealing with these cases as a daily basis. So you see here, this is the patient intraoperative image in the OR. As you see here, once you put the patient on the lateral, you notice it, how the space start opening itself. You see the height compared, for example, to the CT, as you see here. So just putting the patient on lateral, in this case, start opening the space. Then you put the cage, as you see, almost full reductions of the spondylolisthesis. And then you just need to secure your uh, indirect decompression. And finally, have a full reduction of the spondylolisthesis using a percutaneous pedicle screws, screws, as you see here. And then having a really good outcome. These are the uh, uh, three foot standing pictures showing that you preserve the sagittal balance. And then what I want to show you here, <clears throat> which is for all of us, which is more complicated, is trying to believe that actually the indirect decompression exists. So you see here on the left, this is the CT pre-op. You see a CT post-op, how nice uh, open up and, and decompress. But more importantly is keep an eye on the MRI pre and post. This is the pre-image, take a look at post-op image. So as you see here, there is a really good indirect decompression. All the elements are open and you don't have to do any laminectomies, any foraminotomies. Everything happens just by doing indirect decompression and a very physiological uh, procedure. So you, another more example in here, this is a more extreme example as you see here. This is a grade two spondylolisthesis. Almost, you know, there is no disc space, bone in bone, and um, with very minimal movement of flexion extension. And as you see here, the CT pre-op, uh, seems like I was fused, but actually this is a false image on the on the a CT of uh, not a real fusion, as you see here, uh, and a patient who had a previous uh, less invasive procedure, unfortunately, was a some kind of decompression that actually aggravated more the instability. So the only option for this patient was doing a fusion, as you see here, doing a lateral transoas, minimal invasive with percutaneous screws. Uh, you can see here the good results of the procedures. You see here full reduction of the spondylolisthesis. And this is a picture two, three years post op, and you see how solid and how robust is the uh, intersomatic uh, fusion. So, and then um, finally, um, I want to keep showing you more cases and, and more applications. This is another great application for the less invasive lateral access to the spine. And the reason that I show you multiple indications of the minimal invasive uh, lateral surgery and the applications is to show how actually the lateral surgery make a paradigm in terms of on the, all the options that we have for surgery. So continuing this um, example, is this is another patient that we see every day. This patient unfortunately have a previous fusion at the L4, L5 level and uh, it was not uh, provided with the correct uh, global uh, balance and lordosis uh, segmentally at that level. And then the patient developed an adjacent segment uh, uh, failure and a compression. 
at the, in this case, at the L3, L4 level. So you see the previous surgery wasn't efficient in terms of patient was able to get a fusion, but this patient never get the lordosis that he needed. This patient definitely need more lordosis in the first procedure, and that's probably why develop the a adjacent proximal segment failure. So you see here, this is actually intraoperative pictures. You see when you place these cages, as you notice in here, uh, in this case, we're using the maximum size of cages available, which is a, a 26 millimeter from the anterior to posterior. And you see how you basically cover, uh, you see the markers, almost 90% of the vertebral body, you provide a really good uh, decompression and still you can um, go and capture the screws in a less invasive way using a percutaneous uh, techniques, placing your percutaneous screws and using here again, before and after left and right, the amount of uh, indirect decompression. This is the CT pre-op, you see the spondy at, at, um, at the L3 or 4 level. And then you see here, notice the gain of height on the interest space, the amount of uh, area that we have to place the cage and the fusion, and also the good reduction of the spondylolisthesis. So you see it's a very complete uh, way to deliver a great solution. And as you see here, these are just pictures on the posterior part. So in, instead of opening a one big midline incision with all the dealing with the previous scars, sutures, and tissues from uh, the previous surgery, actually you have the option still to go percutaneous, minimal invasive, capture the previous fusion, and then extend it as we see here from the previous uh, instrumentation extended and using percutaneous techniques and you deliver actually a really good minimal invasive solution. And uh, all of you have done these cases and remember how painful is home, open all this incision, takes all these previous screws out. So you see here, this is a really good uh, example on minimal invasive techniques and uh, the lateral approach. Okay, moving forward, uh, we, um, what I think I'm going to show you probably where the lateral axis bring the more unique value for us as a spine surgeon, which is the management of the uh, thoracic disc herniations. Uh, to all of us, we cannot deny that thoracic disc calcifications, thoracic disc herniations with be calcified, they're the most probably ch challenging surgeries for us. Uh, why? Because the complication usually is paralysis, it's not anymore foot drop like in the lumbar spine or CSF leaks. Um, for example, if we, uh, if we have a, any neural, neural injuries, it's actually paraplegia. And then the second part is we know how secluded are the thoracic disc herniation. Usually are on the midline, usually they are calcified and it's very hard to deal with. They're protected by the chest, the access from the posterior part, there is no possibility to move the anural elements like in regular lumbar discs. And then you end up doing these big uh, uh, lateral extra cavitary approaches where you have to make a huge mobilization of tissues in order to have an oblique kind of view of the disc space. But when you go anterior or lateral, actually the access is very good. But the problem is the standard surgeries, the standard procedures when we need the thoraco, um, uh, thoracic surgeons to give the access for that, usually they make these huge incisions that we call the sharp bite incision. You see in this uh, left uh, exposure, this patient has a surgery for a thoracic disc. They can look at the massive side of this incision. This patient basically, that's what we call, you know, the a shark, uh, see if I can make a little shark in here, the shark bite incision. Now, you know, we make fun of that, you know, because um, there is no need. It's, it's hard to believe for me that you have to split a patient in half to have access to a small area where you take the disc out. So in the right, you see, for example, in here, similar pro problem with a small incision, you know, six, seven centimeters, and you're able to deliver the same procedure just using the less invasive lateral approaches. So let me show you, for example, a, a, a one a couple of good examples. So this case, for example, is a patient with a calcified 
T6, T7 thoracic discs. I'm sure that most of you have having this type of challenging case in your practices. So the question is how you deal with this. I mean, if you go posteriorly, you have to take all this rib, you have to move all these muscles out, all these muscles, and then finally you take all these structures and you have kind of a uh, indirect, not direct view. But if you go from lateral, you see how nice you can access and you have control over the normal part and also you can see your calcified area and also take a look of the uh, neural elements. So you see here in this case, after, and you see before and after, actually how nice you can actually access that. Notice in this case that the aorta was located right here. And when you go with your tube, actually you're able to move the vessels anteriorly they move sequentially, and then you're able to take the pedicle, the head of the rib, and remove the herniation. This is a great alternative for this type of patients. In this video, I'm gonna show you one case. This is actually a, what we call a giant calcified disc herniation. You see here, this is a mid um, um, thoracic uh, calcified disc. Um, hopefully we can move the video. Let me just. So in this case, we're going to uh, show you a um, giant calcified disc as we're looking here on the mid thoracic spine. This patient obviously show up with significant myelopathy, a lot of uh, uh, changes and significant intractable uh, mid thoracic pain. You see here the patient placed on lateral position, as uh, you see here marking the incision. So this is drawing of the vertebras, the effect, and then you see here uh, is a mini open exposure, which incision is five, six centimeters. In this case, we're looking for the uh, endothoracic fascia in order to have a retro pleural approach. That way we avoid to get into the thoracic uh, cavity and still have the beautiful access on the side. So you see here, you develop this retropleural plane little by little, which is, I like it because remind us of the microsurgery when, you know, when, when we do all the neurosurgical, when we spend all these years as a resident learning microsurgical techniques, this is one of the, the places that we can use these amazing um, uh, skills that we develop as a resident. You see here, we take the head of the rib out in this case, I was using one of these ultrasonic bone scalpels. So once you take the head of the rib out, the next um, area that is exposed is the pedicle. So this is the pedicle that is uh, exposed from the side. So once you drill a little bit of the pedicle, you should be able to expose the neural elements. So you know exactly where is the anterior part of the canal. And then as you see here, you start doing a partial anterior, a partial corpectomy. It's on your screen, anterior is on the top of your screen, posterior is on the lower part of your screen. The head is on the a right side of your screen, the legs are on the left. So you see here, you make this um, cut and then you keep drilling in front of the a, a neural elements as you saw on that insert. So in here we are crossing from the vertebra above where is the drill right now? Now on the vertebra below, and in the middle is the rudimentary disc space. So once you create that cavity, then as you see here, we start dissecting and start moving into that cavity that we create from posterior to anterior in order to start dealing with this big uh, calcification. So you see here, we release the posterior longitudinal ligament, proximal and distal, and you see here, it's giving me a little bit of window of the a dura and the neural elements and then little by little you keep your dissection and using that cavity that we created anterior that partial corpectomy in order to have access to the uh, pathology and then you release it and then you see how uh, nice and um, I would say elegant you can get rid of a very complicated problem without first doing an less invasive way Second, without violating the chest, 
as you see, no need for chest tube with a very, uh, I would say, good size incision. This is before MRI. And take a look how dramatic is the postoperative MRI. You see full decompression. So uh, it's a really good uh, option. So in here, again, you see here, pre and post. So how amazing is with a very small incision, probably a fraction of the regular thoracic incisions, finding your, your a, a retropleural dissection, you can get exactly what the problem is and do an amazing job. So then um, moving forward, we're gonna explain you now and show you another great application of the lateral access in a minimal invasive way to the spine. Now it's on deformity. And I will say deformity is, 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 is amazing and I love to do deformity cases. And the reason is, the reason is, is because only in deformity is when we use all the techniques together and then we choose which one is the best one for the patient. And when you do it in a less invasive way, it's an amazing because you're reducing the, the footprint, the damage of the soft tissues, but you're still trying to deliver the results of the open uh, surgeries. So, so I'm gonna show you here, this is a couple of publications and I've been, um, um, I will say, honored to be part of the International Spine Story Group, which we uh, put together all of our experience in a, a group of uh, surgeons with a lot of experience on minimal invasive. This is the MIS group of the ISSG where we've been very prolific publishing our experience. This paper is actually a showing, uh, comparing within the entire group, what is the, the role of the less invasive techniques in deformity. And this, for example, in here, we find out that definitely when uh, we use the less invasive techniques, the outcomes are significant, uh, at least the same to the open. And we still uh, don't have the less, um, the, the, the complications that can happen with the open approaches. However, you have to understand that this is a, not a topic from today, but I want to make sure that you understand that uh, not every patient with deformity is candidate for less invasive procedures. So you have to know exactly <clears throat> what procedure uh, is good for what, and you do it. But I'm gonna show you a couple of examples. The other thing is the way that the lateral actually helps on the minimal invasive uh, deformity is with this variation of the lateral axis, which is called the anterior column realignment of the ACR procedure. And basically what it is, is you cut the anterior longitudinal ligament going from lateral, you fish mount this space, and then you start providing a lot of lordosis. And, and this is probably, I will say, the most efficient way to provide lordosis using uh, less invasive techniques. And it is very interesting, as you see here on this uh, paper that we put together, is that actually there is different grades of getting lordosis when you uh, do the anterior column release. And if you're looking here, actually, uh, depending on how much posterior elements you take, you provide more lordosis when you do the release of the anterior longitudinal ligament and you place these hyperlordotic cages. We're talking about 20, 30 degree cages. So as you see here, there is actually up to five different grades and which is interesting is as you see, you notice on this paper um, that uh, you want to take note and take a look with more detail. It was published in August of 18 on, on the uh, Journal of uh, Neurosurgery uh, Spine. And as you see here, actually we joined forces with a Dr. Schwab. You know, as, as all of you know, the a Schwab a classification of osteotomy. So we use Schwab and we use the ACR. And actually we put together, as you see here, a, a comprehensive classification where you do an ACR and you combine it with a Schwab uh, osteotomy, in this case, for example, with the Taiwan Schwab, then you start having some lordosis. So I encourage you to see that. So I'm gonna show you here on this video, how amazing and how efficient is the anterior colon release, the ACR lateral to provide lordosis. So you see here, this is a classic lateral retroperitoneal exposure. Once you find the lumbar plexus, you place your uh, retractor, as you see here, you have access to the, uh, this space. And then when you are 
on the a disk space as using here uh, with access to the disk. In this case, we use an endoscopic uh, tool just to be able to do a better teaching uh, job using here. You start taking the disk first on the screen. The uh, lower part of your screen is posterior. The upper part of your screen is uh, anterior as using here right and left is cranial caudal. So you see here, you uh, perform a good a um, disc removal, but this is the detail, okay? Instead of going right now and placing the cage, notice that we start dissecting little by little the anterior longitudinal ligament. And this is a maneuver that has to be very well performed and you have to have some experience doing uh, the lateral access to the spine. As you see here, you dissect the anterior longitudinal ligament, and which is very careful is at the other side of that retractor that you see there is actually the big vessels. So if you don't get the right plane, you can create a really bad uh, complication. So you have to be careful, and that's what we want you to do this when you are actually uh, very, uh, I would say you have a good experience using the lateral access. You don't want your first case lateral DNA CR doing the anterior column really you see here, once you dissect and um, the anterior longitudinal ligament, you cut it as you see here behind the blade in order to have a full release of the uh, this space. Notice in here on this fluoroscopy image, uh, the position of the knife and where we were cutting the anterior longitudinal ligament. Once the ligament is cut, like is in here, um, you will see now we put these a, uh, uh, distractors and little by little we start opening until we see that actually the space give up and open up as much as possible as you see here, you know, 20, 25 millimeters opening. Now, as you see here, the, the, this space is totally a, exposed and open. And then we place these a, a hyper lordotic cages. We're talking about 20, 30 degrees lordotic cages into the space. And uh, these cages actually provide real lordosis. So this is actually the counterpart of doing the equivalent of like a PSO on the back. So obviously it's a risky procedure, but don't forget that we compare in this procedure to the pedicle sustraction osteotomy, which is a surgery that comes with significant morbidity, as all of you know. So you see here, you put the cage, you secure to the vertebra above and below, and then we start removing the retractor from the psoas, from the retroperitoneum, and you see how, um, le I mean, how uh, few impact we create in the soft tissue by doing this. You see here, pre and post images, Take a look on that L3, L4, how much lordosis we provided on this patient just by cutting the ligament and placing this hyperlordotic cage. In this case, three degrees to 24 degrees, you know, you're giving 20 degrees of segmental lordosis in a single level. So you see here, the ACR is an amazing, um, I would say it's a great application of the lateral in order to provide a, a good a lordosis, and specifically in cases on the formula. So I'm going to show you one more case of the formula. This is another case, and I like to show these cases because looking here, unfortunately, this patient, someone in the community provided a 4551 fusion without providing lordosis. And then what happened? It creates a monster because then you start with the domino effect, you know. Patient is out of global balance. All the spinopelvic parameters are outside of the box. And now this patient is facing a significant problem. Yeah, so the first question is, what were you doing here, you know? So if we talk to, you know, classic um, uh, deformity surgeons, you know, the open surgeon, we're talking about, uh, you know, Larry Lenke, Chris Shaffrey, Greg Mondes, you name it. Um, what they will do in here is, you know, big midline incision, open everything, takes all the hardware out, and then the classic T10 to iliac, which is probably the, the, the right surgery. But I'm going to show you in this case how if you mix minimal invasive technique and open techniques, actually you can provide a really good solution. And this is why always I say my belief is that the modern spine surgeon 
should be able to do minimal invasive techniques in one side and open techniques in one side. I don't think on the modern life, there is no room now for, I'm an open surgeon, I'm an MIS surgeon. You should be able to do both, you know, that I would say, and this is what we try to do with our residents, our fellows, make sure that when they sit in front of the patient, they're able to provide the patient what is the best for him. No, like, a, oh, I don't believe on MIS techniques or, oh, I don't believe on open techniques, you know. Some patients are great for open, so patients are great for MIS. Some patients actually can have both techniques on the same time, which is this case. So you see here, this is the previous surgery, you see, so actually very solid fusion of I1. Unfortunately, absolutely no lordosis. Good fusion of 4-5, again, loss of lordosis. You see between 4-5 and 5-1, there is, I mean, I would say it's maybe one degree of lordosis, or maybe kyphosis. And then, unfortunately, take a look what happened, and you have to be careful. Someone came and did a lateral access to the level above when, when the patient started failing, and this surgeon didn't take into account that this patient need lordosis at this level. So just by adding one cage on the top, he actually created a more complicated problem. Why? Because this is gonna keep failing. Now, the patient is failing at two, three. Now the problem is more complicated. So you're looking here, this is the MRI of the patient. Actually, this, you know, it has no neural compression on the lower levels, significant stenosis at the new adjacent segment failure, as you see here. And then, so this is what we did in the surgery. So this patient needs, you know, 30, 35 degrees of lordosis. So an ACR alone, it will not be sufficient to give the lordosis. So what I did is, as you see here, see, you can follow me on this case that is a little bit complex, is the first stage. What I did is I open on the back. As you see, take a look at the shape of L5. Yeah, it's a square pre-op. Take a look at the shape of the first stage. So in this, so this patient had a L5 PSO. So I did a PSO in here. Now is this is the fifth stage. PSO on L5, classic open PSO, like described by Lenky, Shafri, you name it. Okay. Then that day I put all, I took advantage because I was posterior. I put all the percutaneous screws in a modular fashion, you will see the next picture, without the polyaxial heads. And the reason is, because I do in stages, I cannot put percutaneous screws and leave the towers on there, you know, you cannot take the patient away from that. So you use modular screws as you see here, so that way I can close for the first day, and then you see here in this area, I open it, took the previous uh, hardware, I did a PSO, and then I did it with a satellite construct similar to what Chris Ains and Munish Gupta have on their original description. You know, you do a PSO, you did a satellite, and then I left all these screws, modulars, waiting for the second stage. Okay, now the second stage, I went from lateral, you see here, at two, three, I start opening. Actually, I took advantage and did an ACR at the L2, L3 level, as you see here. You put a big cage, you put a hyperlordotic cage. Yeah, every time you see a screw, Holding a cage, it means like a, probably you did an ACR, ACR on ALL release because that's the way that you keep this cage from going into the peritoneum. If you don't do an ACR, you don't need the screws to hold in the cage because the ligament hold it, okay? But that's not the point, okay? So we get there. And then as you see here, I flip the patient posterior. I open only the skin from the first part. So the ACR is somewhere around here. I leave the fascia closed. And then I capture with the towers each of the polyaxial heads of the polyaxial screws, as you see here. And then using a, a obviously a percutaneous technique. And this case, we're using this computerized uh, system that let us know where the heads are. Then you pass the rod and you actually soar, you know, you fly over the a PSO but you go totally percutaneous and actually you can deliver in a really good surgery without the need to do the entire surgery open. So you see here pre-op after the first stage, after the PSO, and then after this one is after the PSO and after the ACR. So you see here in this case, a really good example of combining open techniques, using here a PSO, an MIS technique, an ACR, 
providing a really good lordosis in a patient that has actually flat back. Uh, you see here be, before and after, how come you can use all these techniques and get a really good procedure. So now we're getting at the end of the uh, talk. So I'm gonna show you now, uh, actually, it's very interesting because the lateral axis to the spine keep changing. You know, we just don't do lateral and then we say we're done. You know, we, we, there is nothing else to do. So we find out, for example, now uh, there is a trend that uh, how can you become more efficient and you lose less time? You know, the first cases that I show you that the uh, spondylolisthesis that you saw grade one and grade two and four, five, they're very efficient, great solutions, but those patients you were going lateral first, then you had to close, put the patient on prone position, prep again, you know, all the drapes, put screws, you know, so it's, it's at two stages in the same day that you lose time and also is not, uh, the, you, you spend more money, yeah? All these drapes again. And so definitely it's not as efficient. So now what we're doing, which is very interesting is actually we are a, now doing a, the laterals on the prone position or on the lateral position, still doing the instrumentation on patient on lateral. So we call it single position surgery. So you do it with the patient on prone on the patient on lateral. And as you see here, so this patient, for example, I'm gonna show you one or two examples since we still have time. So it's another patient with a previous fusion. Notice that all the patients that I'm showing you are patients, most of them with previous surgeries, because I want you to keep in your mind that someone else did this surgery he was not thinking that if you don't provide the right lordosis, specifically at four, five, and five, one, you creating more problems. So it's another patient. You see here, doesn't look too much out of balance, but when you look in here, this patient has definitely an unstable spondylolisthesis at the proximal level, and this is probably related to a big laminectomy. These screws actually are violating somehow the facets, and then this patient develop this instability at three, four. You see here between the flexion and extension, how much it reduces. So again, this is the MRI, very classic MRI, you know, central stenosis, foraminal stenosis. And then um, if you look at the CT pre-op. So what we did is again, we go lateral first, but in this case, we do it actually in prone position. So you see here, we put the patient in prone position you see, this is the head is toward here. This is the midline posterior. This is the lateral incision to access the L3, L4 level. As you see here, which is great in here is, this surgery is very interesting because this patient has a really bad central stenosis with a lot of bone. You see here this posterior. So, and all these curly roots in here. So sometimes the indirect decompression is not enough. So what we did in this case is actually, you see how versatile is when you're working in proposition lateral. While I was doing the lateral axis, my fellow actually was doing the posterior approach, working simultaneously, doing the, the direct decompression. So you see the incision on the top for the laminectomy and the decompression, and then the incision on the side for actually the lateral interbody fusion. As you see here, so this is, I mean, obviously a lot of time savings, because while you're doing parts of the lateral, the, the other surgeon is doing the posterior decompression, as you see here, then you have access. Actually, it looks pretty much the same. And as you see here, I'm working on the lateral. This time, the, uh, the uh, uh, other surgeon take away, so they don't get radiation for sh Then you start doing your lateral access, as you see here. And then a you uh, keep doing your interbody, you place your cage, and then you go posterior, you replace the previous screws, you re-instrument, and then this is the result. So you have a circumferential access to the spine simultaneously with a lot of time savings and a good result. You see a pre and post-op MRI, how nice now we don't have this compression posteriorly, good, a. Uh, balance of the spine and uh, good outcome, I'm happy patient, okay? So, so another one, we still, 740, we still have time. So I'm gonna show you one more case. 
Uh, again, we're gonna keep showing single position surgery. That I would say this is the trend right now. How can we avoid you know multiple stages? We just do it in one time. So this is a 60 year old male, multiple comorbidities, previous laminectomies, fail all the conservative treatments with intractable back pain and leg pain. You see here, previous laminectomies a little bit in here. There's no spinous processes. Uh, this is the MRI as you see here. Um, he has a spondium 4-5, he has a retrolisthesis on 3-4, and a, all these previous laminectomy. So you see here on the CT, unfortunately, some of these facets were damaged during the open uh, laminectomy on the back. So this patient basically needs 4-5, 3-4, but you don't want to leave 5-1 alone because all this area fuse with these facets with not a good quality, it, this level would fall apart. So... In my book, this patient need three to one, yeah? So in order to do this, see, we notice in here, we put the patient on lateral. We do the A lift with the patient on lateral. So this is the uh, patient on lateral. This is the, the a, a right side up. You see here, you have access to the a 5-1 A lift. We do it on lateral position. Then we, Right away, since the patient is on lateral, we do the uh, interbodies lateral, the MIS lateral at 3, 4, and 4, 5. And then we put the screws with the patient on lateral. You see here the towers. We still with the patient on lateral. You deliver your screws. So you have do a single position surgery. In this case, uh, it's interesting because we're doing the 5, 1 on lateral, obviously in lateral the other levels and then we put the percutaneous screws using lateral techniques and using here the pre and post MRI with a really good results. So it's a really good example. And then last case. So we go over the questions and anything else. We still have a uh, six, seven minutes. So this is a 45 year old male. Uh, this is a very interesting patient. Actually it's a radiologist, uh, a resident, a radiology resident. Uh, very, uh, as you know, looking for million options, trying to find that. So this patient actually have a grade one spondy at uh, L4, L5. And in this case, for example, as you see here, this is the classic spondylolisthesis grade one with parse defect that is moving on flexion extension, as you see here. And this patient, you know, in a great shape, but he couldn't get better from his pain. You look in here, the MRI, classic uh, images, of the spondylolisthesis, you know, for aminal stenosis, a little bit of central stenosis and the instability that come with that. So you see the a, a CT pre-op, very clear, the parse defect. And then see, notice the location of the foramen with the vertebra. So you see how unstable it is, you know, it moves a lot between one and the other one. So in this case, we do it single position, but this one, instead of having the patient on lateral because it was in four or five, we use the entire surgery in prone position. So you're looking here, the patient in prone position, marking the level at four or five. As you see here, is a little bit of video of the picture. So you see here, we mark the incision just on uh, above of the Lea crest. Then once we uh, get in there, so you see here, you start opening the skin, you start dilating. Uh, you see, not notice that it's a blown dissection of the abdominal muscles. You don't want to go with a bobby and cut the ilioinguinal and the iliohypogastric nerves. And then you have these uh, pseudo abdominal hernias, which you're not careful can happen and the patient don't like it. So once you do the dissection, then uh, what you do is you a, um, use again uh, monitoring in this, so you see here using the real time EMG monitoring, trying to make sure that I'm in the front of the a lumbar plexus. And then once you make sure that you are in front of the lumbar plexus, and don't forget when you do a transverse approach, you really need a good EMG system that actually gives you directionality because you need to make sure that your retractor is in front of the femoral nerve. So you retract it from anterior to posterior. So once you do that, you see here, you place the retractor, you start doing the interbody work, you put your cage, as you see here, with partial reduction, and then you go and you put your percutaneous screws, you get a really good anatomical reduction 
with a excellent uh, results. And you see here the MRI before, the MRI after. You see very nice, no need to do laminectomies for laminotomies, total restoration of the anatomical uh, level. And as you see them CT pre and post, how good is I mean, the placement of the cage, the placement of percutaneous screws, and everything with the patient in prone uh, position. So in conclusion, just to finish, so we have time for questions. Uh, the, the MIS lateral access to the spine and in general, the minimal invasive uh, access to, to the spine is a great alternative option to all the other techniques. Uh, obviously, it's very important to know all the anatomical facts and all the regional anatomic of the retroperitoneum, all the lumbar plexus. You have to be very meticulous with your technique and then obviously, as always in the spine, the key to success is choose the right patient for the right surgery. Thanks very much. Questions? Thank you very much, Dr. Uribe, for such a wonderful lecture. Uh, we have a few questions from the public. So the first one is, uh, is there any advantage between Trump SOAS approaches versus Olive? Yeah. So, yeah. So first, I have to... Uh, in order to answer this question, I'm going to tell you why the OLIF exists. So the OLIF is the answer from the surgical community and the spine industry to a lack of good directional EMG monitoring. So when you don't have a good monitoring system or good access system to the spine, the only option that you have is go in front of the muscle, retract it, that's the OLIF, yeah? The OLIF is basically a mini open access to the spine in an oblique way, moving the, the psoas from anterior to posterior. And that way, since you don't go directly through the muscle and you don't have to negotiate the lumbar plexus as on trans psoas, you can deliver that option. The problem is you have to understand the fact that the oblique doesn't give you nerve injuries it doesn't take you from another family of complications. So if the transoas give you a lot of lumbar plexus injuries, if you don't do it right, then the oblique is gonna give you vascular injuries, ureter injuries, all the injury that comes anterior into that. So this is basically the big difference between the olive and the transoas. I personally do transoas because I, I like it to do percutaneous to a small incision. I don't like to put my head and start looking at scary, you know, retroperitoneal vessels and things. I like to be there dealing with the nerve, retract the nerve, get out of there in 10, 15 minutes. And I can promise you, your nerve injuries are have to be less than one or 2%. Okay, sir. Uh, what do you think about x leaf Olive standalone? Okay, so that's a really good option. Uh, there is only one important thing on you doing lateral standalone. One is that the patient has to be on sagittal balance. If you, uh, one of the examples that I show you, someone didn't stand alone there in a patient that was not on balance, then the patient fails. So that's the problem with the standalone. Otherwise, a really good surgery because you avoid all the manipulation of the posterior elements, which normally provides a lot of pain to the patients. Every time that I do a stalon on one or two levels, traditionally the patient go home the same day. If I just put one little screw on the back, that patients are very hard to send them home the same day. Great. Uh, do you use an approach surgery for lateral, oblique, and anterior approaches? On, only for the, for the A-leaf, I use it because in, in America, there is a legal, um, uh, problematic with that. I will say the, the first A-leaf approaches were uh, always performed with access surgeons, so it's very hard if you have a complication as a surgeon do it. But in general, uh, otherwise everything is by myself, you know. I don't think the retroperitoneal approach and the, and the retropleural transthoracic, there is no need for an access surgeon. I mean, you have to know what you're doing, obviously. Yes, sir. Do you use neuromonitoring for your surgeries? If yes, is it done by yourself or you invite a neurophysiatrist? So the system that I use is 100% a a surgeon driven. So I, I actually do it by my own. So you don't, I mean, it's just very simple. It's a, you have the system that you connected and then you have directionality 
and you basically trying to map what is the lumbar plexus. So that's good because it's also savings for the health system. You know, if you use somebody else um, uh, for monitoring, they will charge the system. Somewhere we have to pay for that. If the surgeon do it, actually it's included on the surgery. Okay. In scoliosis, do you prefer to do the approach by the concavity or the convexity of the curve? A great question, yeah. So the answer is concavity. I pretty much, and the reasons are why. One is because usually the concavity, four or five level, takes you away from the iliac crest. Second one is when you put the patient with the concavity up, just by breaking the table, this, the, the deformity start correcting. And the other one is with one incision, the vectors, I can access multiple levels. When you go from the convex side, you, you go from the chest all the way down, you know, it's like a huge incision. So that's why I like to go on the concave side. Okay. Can percutaneous instrumentation reduce PJK rate and deformity progression? Uh, that's what we believe, but I don't think is we, I mean, at the ISSG, we couldn't 100% demonstrate it. And still we have PJK with percutaneous screws because I think the problem with the PJK is we don't understand it 100%. It's a multifactorial problem. So, I mean, we like the idea that the percutaneous screws leave all the interspinal ligament intact and you don't need to manipulate too much posterior elements, but it's not the solution to prevent the PJK. I mean, it can help, but it's not the solution. Okay, how do you imagine the future of a spinal surgery? Or are we already in the future? Well, I mean, we always pushing, uh, we live in, but I think the future, it's gonna be very interesting. I think we're not gonna be fusing people anymore. I think we will be laughing. You know, we're talking about, you know, 40, 50 years from now, we probably will not be here, but it's gonna be similar to, you remember, that I, this, I like to put this example. If you remember in the 1800s, how they treat tuberculosis, they used to open the chest and put like a ping pong balls there. So how do we treat tuberculosis today? You take three medications, couple of weeks and you get cured. So it's, it's amazing, yeah? So spine is gonna be the same. I think it's a big tendency to uh, regeneration of the disc spaces, uh, trying to avoid fusions, but the, the, I would say the close future is using what we call enabling technologies. You know, we're talking about robotics, navigation, augmented reality. Uh, that's probably the near future, the long future, far probably is gonna be just a decompressions and a very little footprint, no fusions anymore. Okay. Uh, have you had any nerve injury due to the use of a very high cache uh, because of tension of the nerve? Uh, no, the, the, the complications, the lumbar plexus injury is more than height of the cage is actually the amount, the, the, the amount of retraction and the time of retraction. Uh, what happened when you put up very tall cages is that unless you, you don't have the anterior longitudinal ligament release, you get a lot of pressure on the cage, on the end plates, and then you will have a lot of subsidence. If you ask me, for example, 90% uh, of my cases, the height of the cages are eight millimeters or 10 millimeters. I can count with my hands, how many times I've been using higher than 10, like a 12, 14 millimeters, you know, and this is, you have to be careful because when you come in as a T leafer that you always use 10 millimeter or a leaf that they use like huge cages, you have this tendency to do that. You don't get nothing by oversizing because then you're gonna have a lot of subsidence. And don't forget the biggest enemy of the lateral access surgeon is subsidence because you lose all your indirect decompression. So I only use big cages when I cut, when I do the ACR, because the segment is already loose. You know, you hold the big cages. Okay. Do you use visual magnification for a lateral lumbar interbody fusions? Uh, say it again. Sorry, I didn't listen. Mm -hmm. Do you use visual magnification for lateral lumbar interbody fusions? I, I use uh, visual magnification means like, a, I mean, I do it with the loops. Maybe that's the, uh, the question. I use, I use it with the loops. I don't use microscope, obviously. And I try to do as much as possible percutaneous, you know. I like to do it the less invasive way. So the incision for a single level is, you know, is 
four centimeters. You know, I don't like do anything mini open. I like to go percutaneous, feel the psoas, then dilate percutaneous the psoas, put the retractor, open it up, get out of there as fast as possible. Okay. What is your appreciation of X leaf, O leaf, corpectomy? Uh, it's a really good uh, application. You know, the problem is a corpectomy is a big surgery. You know, it requires a lot of work. But every time I had to do a corpectomy in the thoracolumbar area, thoracic area, obviously I use the the, the the lateral approach. You know, I use it. I use lateral because at the end, when you're doing a corpectomy, you cannot say O leaf of of X leaf. You're you're going. You know, you're anterior and you're mid. You're you're in the entire vertebra. So. It's, I would say Larida. Yeah, I like it. It's great. It's a great application. Okay. Um, is there any concern about anterior slippage or of hyperlotrotic cages? Yes. And that's why you, uh, as I mentioned during the talk, every time you cut the anterior and you're doing a ligament, you have to use one of these cages with ears. So you pin it with a screw so the cage does not migrate anteriorly. As long as you have a screw holding, it's very hard to have a migration. What you have to be careful is a lot of, all of us, when you're lateral surgeon, you do a unintended anterior column release. You cut the anterior and you turn a ligament without knowing. When you happen, when this happened, you have to be honest yourself and that cage has to have a screw because you leave it alone, that cage is gonna move forward. How good is pain control after these kind of procedures? I mean, pain is a very, as you know, pain is very subjective. You know, sometimes you do a four level lateral and the patient wanted to go home next day. Sometimes you do a single level and the patient stay one week in the hospital. You know, pain is very subjective. What I can tell you is compare, you know, I'm in a very, I'm in a big uh, group of uh, neurosurgeons here at the Barrow Neurological Institute where we have approximately 15 spine surgeons and it's everything, open and MIS and everything. I can tell that the patients that have MIS surgeries, they tend to go home earlier and they tend to have less wound complications. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Riber, for such a wonderful lecture. Uh, we're really grateful with you and honored for your participation in the 2020 IWBNC. You're more than welcome to stay tuned and watch more lectures from other speakers. Um, in a few minutes, we'll have Dr. Hughes Dufault doing his lecture, Early Maximal Safe Resection in Low-Grade Gliomas, a personalized connectome-based approach, more than a thousand awake surgeries. So if you wanna get the link for this upcoming conference, please follow the link pinned here in the chat, on the chat, or check the agenda on our website. Thank you, Dr. Uribe. Thanks very much, Javier. A, a question, how many participants we got on this one? Uh, so we got more than more than 400 participants. Okay, that's perfect. Okay, thanks very much, and uh, uh, honored to be invited. Until the next time, thank you. Okay, sir.